Excellent. Welcome everyone to the RASIS Global Meeting. And uh, today we are going to be talking about envisioning a post-pandemic smart city. When we think about a post-pandemic smart city, as we look at all response to recovery to the pandemic must be based on human rights principles. Cities should lead. Actually, I'm going to pause for one second and ask everybody to mute. We are recording, so just if everyone can please mute. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. So starting all over real quick. Uh, welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about envisioning a post-pandemic smart city. When we think about smart cities in a post-pandemic world, we, we understand that all responses to, re to recovery to the pandemic must be based on human rights principles. We cannot leave people behind, especially now in a post-pandemic economy. Cities should lead the move to recovery towards a new social contract between government, public sector, civil society, private sector, to reduce poverty, inequalities, and improve living for all people in our communities. Uh, our panel abstract today, we're going to be talking about how the pandemic has disrupted cities and communities worldwide. Induced by the pandemic, proactive mayors are now pursuing a quantum leap in a way that they're using technology to structure and manage their cities. Today, we have Janice Kovac, president of the New Jersey League of Municipalities and the mayor of Clinton, New Jersey. We have Tony Cho, chief executive officer and founder in Future Cities USA. Joe Landon, vice president of Lockheed Martin. Nguyen At Tuan, CEO of the Boston Global Forum. So we're going to get started. And um, ideally, what we want everyone to do is please limit your answers to two minutes so that we have an opportunity to let everyone have an opportunity to speak, as well as have an opportunity to provide later feedback. So I will be timing and I will remind you when the two minutes are up, just so that we keep everybody on point. So uh, Janice, we're going to we're going to start with you and like to kind of dive right into it. But what are the best practices you as somebody that not only is working with the League of Municipalities, an entire state, right? You're you're in the middle of this, right? You are actually not at, not just at the state level, but at the local level. Right. When you start to look at your in your own background, like what are the best practices to build smart cities while fully embracing digital innovation? And can you also please dive into an example? Sure. So, uh, you know, New Jersey is, is a unique state in that we are uh, made up of 565 municipalities and each one of us is different in how we approach. You've got three um, cities that are 100,000 people or more and the remaining are less than 100,000 people. So you've got all of these different aspects of it. Newark is probably one of the best examples. Uh, Mayor Baraka has been an outstanding leader in looking at opportunities within his community. And, and he's done it previously, you know, prior to COVID, what was good about what he did is he looked at what does his community need? What does he need to provide? And he looked to the public private partnerships. We know that we can't do this alone. It is not a, a, a totally government responsibility. And we don't have the resources or the technology experience to be able to, to do what needs to be done for our cities. To have that partnership, uh, I know that he used a partnership with Audible. They came in and they did a, a huge um, initiative within the city to provide technology to the students within the, the school systems. Um, you know, that was one of the, the biggest issues we saw going into the pandemic is you now had schools, which were for a lot of students, that place of refuge now we're stuck at home and didn't have the ability to to learn at the same level that other students were. So that that obligation and that commitment from the public and the private communities to help expand access and then the commitment from the city itself to make sure that every student had what was needed. He's going he's doing a project right now around um, guaranteed income. So for the most vulnerable communities, those residents have an opportunity to apply for a guaranteed income. And I think that's something that we're going to start looking at in some of these communities. It's an opportunity. It's new. It's innovative. It's, it's different and scary at the same time, especially for those that have you know, never experienced it before or don't understand enough about it. But I think what COVID did for us is, is 
force us to look at to look outside the box and stop thinking the way things have always been. This is the way we've done it. Government dates back to the 1700s. We're now in the 21st century and we need to focus our energies on what government looks like as a partner in the 21st century. You're muted, Sergio. I am not. I'll keep talking. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Excellent. So, Cody, with your experience in, can you guys hear me well? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. It's robotic, it sounds. Uh, it was, you, I can hear you now, though. Yeah, give us a little, little bit, bit of robotic. your experience. Hmm. Hmm. Tony. Yes. <laughs> Can you guys all hear me okay? Or is there that robot? Okay, I'll, I'll just go, Sergio, because I don't know if it's on your end or my end. But in the. No, no, now I hear you, you really well, so please afford yours. Yeah, no. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio and Janice. I totally agree with you and concur about public private partnerships and this problem being much greater than any one organization, individual, government, or corporation. You know, I think that one thing the pandemic showed is that, you know, in time of crisis and need, you know, all of us coming together can solve great problems. And even the amount of vaccines that were produced in such a sh short period of time, whether you're a believer of vaccines or not, you know, it was all about our kind of very focused energy around a solution and coming together. So I think that was really important. Um, I know in the, in the in information, they asked us to introduce ourselves. I know you did a little bit of an introduction, um, but my name is Tony Cho, and I'm an impact entrepreneur focused on regenerative development practices. Future of Cities, which we launched April 1st, is a multi-sided platform of real estate investment, venture capital ecosystem, and a think tank for regenerative development. And our goal is to positively impact the lives of a billion people through innovation and advancements in the built environment. We're pioneering co-designing a new approach called regenerative placemaking, which we're open sourcing, and we hope to have all of you guys involved in it. And we want to execute flagship portfolio projects, leveraging ESG strategies that can deliver outsized returns to communities and investors alike. So in terms of best practices in smart cities, I think a lot of people were super resistant to technology. Technology has run our lives, but then we've also seen the benefits of it. And you see companies like Uber, and, and Lyft providing food services to the most vulnerable and deliveries and, you know, technology and private sector coming on board to provide <clears throat> services to people that need and are the most in, in vulnerable people. So I think that's one example, you know, a, a one example of how technology has really helped us. And then, you know, there's other companies that are testing sewer in real time and water data to determine the levels of contamination in a particular district. And if you connect all of these sensors and these data collection points and we leverage it for the better good, as long as people are conscious and aware and opting in to use their information, I think technology can work for humanity and not make humanity a slave to technology. Thank you so much, Tony. I really appreciate that. And... Um, Nguyen, um, am I saying that right? I'm sorry. Nguyen, you're on mute. I just hear your mute button. It's on the bottom left. I know. Okay. okay. There we go. Okay. Good. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I uh, we have contributed 
new solution, new ideas for uh, smart city. But we not only do with um, uh, smart city uh, technologies technology for platform, we have solution for uh, digital, virtual, and um, uh, smart connect at the platform at city uh, for people or citizen that is virtual city and virtual citizen we connect all together and uh, <laughs> that is uh, our solution that is, we name that AIWS city why we name AIWS city that is AI was society we have a uh, initiative AI was society and uh, that is the uh, AIWS city is a practice implement our concept and ideas of um, AIWS, AIWS. Uh, AIWS is an initiative contribute for United Nations Centennial uh, and uh, we are very <coughs> uh, very thank for our distinguished thinkers contribute for uh, AIWS city and uh, I think uh, with pandemic it is a very good time we think new our box uh, that is why we uh, build that new concept new model for smart city that is virtual digital and this initiative we build not only that is platform technology we build system value system eco uh, economy technical politics society and uh, that means every people can create value. Every people can make their <coughs> contribution for society and recognize by value. That is uh, our initiative, AIWS City. And uh, yes, um, we to contribute and uh, also introduce more for future. Thank you so much, and and uh, I, I think we're, I'm not sure if everybody's having a little bit of the issue. Or maybe it's, I'm hearing it, but it might. If you are hearing robotic, just let me know so that um, we could figure out at least tell tech support. Um, excellent. Well, Joe, uh, you know, given your background, what have you seen, and what what are you seeing based on your business practice? Uh, you know, especially, I mean, some of the work that Lockheed Martin is doing is not just in outer space. Obviously, they're, do, they're in, involved in so much innovation and on the ground. So um, please give us a little feedback. Sure. Yeah. Th uh, thanks, Sergio. Uh, I'm Joe Landon. I'm the vice president for commercial and civil space uh, advanced programs at Lockheed Martin. And, you know, really, it's a good question. Like, what, you know, we do a lot of work in space exploration and national security and defense. So what is Lockheed? Doing uh, in smart cities, and you know, well, part of our uh, part of my team is is a commercial communications team, and we're uh, we've built and uh, delivered over 200 commercial communication satellites over the years. Um, in addition to satellite platforms, we've also developed secure communication networks for both commercial and government users uh, on the ground, um, and we're also the prime contractor for the GPS satellite I'm program, awesome which. Too really is an essential element to, to I mean, the, the no, city infrastructure of the future. The, um, so what we're, what we're focusing on is how do we leverage our experience in satellite communications uh, for the commercial and military users to enhance terrestrial wireless communication network. So we're not, uh, we, we don't, we think satellite communications has a very important role to play in a smart city. Uh, it, it is not a replacement for a terrestrial network. It's more of an enhancement where, uh, you know, getting back to some of the comments uh, that Janice made, you know, access uh, is really important. And in order to have access to some of these services, you need to have a, a connection to the internet, like in, in most cases, or some other type of communication um, access. So satellites can can bring that sort of 5G connectivity that's in the urban core and expand it out into the suburbs uh, and also um, expand that coverage into some parts of the, like certain elements of the smart city aren't going to be in the smart city. So like the power plant will be outside the city. The water treatment plant won't be in the city. Uh, so we need to bring some of that security and some of that connectivity uh, to these areas that are uh, and people and citizens that are outside of that urban core. So that's that's part of the role that satellite communications can play and that, that we're working on.
I think you're on mute. Search you. <laughs> God bless technology. Arun, Arun, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. And sorry you had a little bit of an issue, um, you know, logging in. And, you know, based on, you know, what we're having a conversation is what are the best practices to build smart cities while fully embracing digital innovations? If you could please yep. uh, take the floor. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this panel uh, on smart cities in the post-pandemic era. Uh, I'm the chairman of Five Elements Sustainable Development Group. We work at the nexus of smart cities, renewable energy, and what I call essential technologies, technologies that alleviate poverty, that improve socioeconomic progress. Now, uh, let's uh, remember that when we talk about digital technologies, the digital technologies are not an end in themselves. The digital technologies are there for a purpose to improve healthcare, education, transportation, training, whatever it is. Uh, now, uh, I myself come from the mobile technology background. I've seen the mobile revolution. We've all seen the internet revolution, the digital revolution. Uh, what we've seen in the process of this pandemic is that the di digital divide is very much present in the global south. Uh, we have stories of students climbing up trees so they get mobile connectivity so they can attend classes. So, so there's a need to close the digital divide gap. There is a need for digital literacy. What happens when a family of four only has one smartphone and two or three kids need to be in different classes? It doesn't work. Uh, that's one of the issues. Uh, and we are seeing this divide. On the other hand, I also see the potential. We're talking about Industry 4.0. We're talking about Society 5.0. So it is possible to evolve a human-centric society and technology needs to serve democracy and it needs to be inclusive in, in the development process. So there is a need for that. Uh, digital technologies can also improve transparency and trust. The potential is there. Trust develops uh, within citizens, between government and citizens, uh, if there is transparency, uh, and that's possible. Is, uh, uh, the final point I want to make is... Because of digital technologies, better monitoring, better tracking, we are able to accelerate learning circles, PDCA circles, plan, do, check, act. And that's going to be important uh, because we are racing against time. As far as SDGs are concerned, as far as climate change are concerned. So the potential is there for sure, but we need to take it to the south. We need to take it to those populations in countries like India, which do not access it at the moment. This is the challenge that I see. And the assumptions are quite different in yeah, India I'm as compared cool. to Europe or USA. I'll stop with that for the moment. Is the voice clear? I see some robotic noise. We only hear a robotic voice from you, Sergio. You only hear robotic noise from me. No, from Sergio. No, everyone else from clear. Sergio. Yeah. yeah. So, so Arun, if I could just you, you, keep things going here, you know, yeah. you, you mentioned the digital divide and the connectivity divide. Like, there, that yes. to me, is two separate problems, right? You can have connectivity, but then no device. Thank you so much. And, and no right. device to access it, but you also need. So you need both. I'm just wondering how is, how that uh, problem sorry. can be addressed separately. Yeah, you do need both. You do yeah. need activity yeah. and you need digital. And there are huge populations that, that don't have access to one or the other. Uh, I can vouch for it myself. When I go back to India, my hometown is a small village. I see the benefit of digital technology and mobile technology that I do have connectivity even when there is a power failure. So it's amazing that the phone works when there is no power. Right. So on the other hand, I also face the problem of bandwidth. I yeah. cannot work as efficiently yeah. myself in India as I work here, when I'm in my village. When I'm in Bangalore, it's different. Yeah? So so I face that right. challenge of connectivity myself. And uh, there are others uh, who don't have the same privileges I enjoy. 
Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And, and my apologies that before it looks like I'm going to log the next question in and then I'm going to log in and log back out because I might have, I might have, it might be me with the connectivity issues. I have no idea, but it's, uh, it's a little bit choppy, but I don't want to take time. Um, so if I leave and come back, don't worry, I'll be right back. Um, I want to get into the, the, the fourth question. So if you all had a chance, what I put together here is envisioning, when we looked at envisioning the post-pandemic smart cities, there's a lot of challenges, right? Given a lot of the, your vast experience, we have from security, from innovation, from leading public service to think tanks, to sustainable development goal focus, right? So we're all kind of, you know, looking at how we are improving the lives of humans, right? And I think that, you know, though we wanted to kind of keep this to short answers, these are very in-depth conversations. So I kind of want to go right to number four, right and 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 get into how and i don't know if you all had a chance to kind of review because what i did is i gave you some high level bullets and kind of rethinking the form and function of the city addressing systemic poverty right inequality what is the new normal of an urban economy and to me that was kind of a key focal point of when we we're looking at what is the future of cities look at in a post pandemic we never planned we never even prepared tony janice and others who we all know each other we have these conversations Never in our reality did we realize that we would have this day that we would be dealing with not even a local, but a global pandemic where we had to lean on technology, right? And sort of invent this tomorrow as quickly as possible because it was the only way. And, and so when we look at getting right to the question, how do we rebuild a new normal urban economy with a clear understanding that the technology we are using to structure and manage our cities can also build a better tomorrow? Janice? Uh, I think we have to look at it at, you know, it starts at a granular level in that, you know, each community is going to be different. The needs of each community will be different. How we address what Newark needs versus what Camden or Atlantic City, those are all, we have to be able to look at the individual and, and, and isolate what's important to those communities and how they need to be able to move forward because it's, you know, just as from the global perspective, we're all different in so many different ways. As you, you know, you talked about the access to the digital divide in India. It's the same thing here. You have communities that are wealthy communities, but have no access to the to the broadband. So you have these individuals who are trying to provide for their communities, and they don't have access. They don't have the resources to be able to go and build what needs to be done. We need to rely, those small communities, those ur those rural communities need to rely on the urban areas to actually start that process, to start building the broadband from the base from the bottom up and then expanding it out. But we also need the state to help us with that. So it's, we all, as individuals and, and community leaders, we need to be looking at what does our community need and to have toolboxes available to us to say, I need to pick from this toolbox, I need to pick from this toolbox, I need to pick from this toolbox. It's not a one size fits all in any way, shape or form. And if we, we try to force a one size fits all, we're not gonna get to where we need to be. We need to recognize the, the differences with each of the communities and what each of those communities is going to bring to, to the table. And, and what my experiences are versus what someone else's experiences may or may not be. I have the benefit of access at the state level and at the national level to have conversations that will benefit my community and my state. Not every local elected official has that. They don't necessarily have the, the local business community to tap into as well. So how do we create these toolboxes that give each community the opportunity to to take what they need and build out from there. And then to create something that's theirs and that is still still sustainable and works together, but is specific to what they need, I, is kind of how I'm looking at it when I look at what is this new normal. Thank you, Janice. I think that's really important that each community has their own specificity of their needs based on their geography, their history, their culture, their language, all of those things. I think it's very critical but there should be, you know, a solution set of technology stacks and best practices and kind of a framework that is co-evolutionary 
that can evolve, but it comes with, you know, a lot of deep listening and fully participatory communities and decentralizing leadership so that decisions can be made locally, but globally informed. And that's really what we're working on kind of with the regenerative placemaking framework that we want to really share. And hopefully we'll get all of those, those components involved. You know, you know, leveraging technology and thinking about cities, one thing that excites me is this concept of rewilding cities, but using AR and technologies to make cities feel like we're more in balance with nature, to see more green space, to smell more of the natural environment. And of course, technology is going to play an active role in that, but also zoning laws and land use policies and really, you know, imposing stricter guidelines on air quality and public health and you know, the connectivity that Joe was talking about, there's 1.7 billion people who are unbanked and unconnected. We have to provide them not only the connectivity, but the devices. So that's a global crisis to bring everybody into the digital age and be able to give them access because that's equity. And I think that's something that we need to create in this post-pandemic world. And really, I think one of the, the, the ideas that I've been thinking about and toying is this concept of universal earned income, where it's not just given, but that citizens need to participate and opt their information out so that they can monetize that data and be provided with their basic needs. And I guess basic needs are contingent on the, sp the specific needs of those communities. The needs in America might be different in India, as Arun you know, very aptly pointed out. So I think those are certain things to take into consideration. There isn't one size fits all. There's cultural considerations. There's community needs. There's 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 a lot of different um, components that come into thriving community, and technology can play a very active and important role to achieving those goals. And we, you know, if we want to have eight billion people going to eleven billion people, we absolutely need to lever leverage technology to support us and to be able to re react quickly. And if everybody had a smartphone and they were opted in and could receive real time data on what's happening at a global scale and what are the best practices, how to re react to threats, climate change, and sea level rise and pandemics, I think we would be much more prepared for the challenges that are ahead. Yes, thank uh, you so much, Tony. Yeah. Thank you so much for that because I, I definitely, you know, I think that you, what, what, one of the things that you said really resonates with what, you know, you guys have received in the PDF. When you look at rebuilding a new urban, urban economy, just by, you know, some of you that don't know me, we do a lot of work with the United Nations. We do, we work very closely with UN Habitat and we've been working on sort of this framework of a post pandemic. You know, how do we bring in public and private, you know, civil society, people, humans, right? Because Tony, I think one of the things that you said so important is that, you know, every single citizen, resident, and, 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 and anyone that is activating and get, actively engaging a city is creating value today in a digital world, right? And how can they be part of that benefit that is creating uh, and, and, and also build a better? And I just want to read this really quick and reframe it uh, based on what Tony said as well. You know, when you look at rebuilding in the new urban economy, and this is one of the pieces from the, the UN report, UN Habitat, a suite of tailored economic support and relief packages should be developed to help smaller businesses, informal workers, and at-risk sectors, right? Something we never thought about. At-risk sectors, not just in the front lines, to survive the crisis with an emphasis on building back better by promoting the transition to greener, right? Very key, and then you pointed that out, Tony, right? Because we forget we're talking a lot of tech but tech and, and sort of also how we build better policy, right? Greener, more equitable, and again, what Tony just mentioned, urban economies through cash-strapped local authorities may be tempted to respond to these pressures by scaling back their communities. And it is essential that they continue the support of national governments, right? Not just the, the local, uh, to maintain services and financial assistance to help residents and businesses survive the crisis. And I want to kind of turn it to a rune because Tony, you referenced some of the comments that he made, and I would love to kind of, you know, get um, your sort of uh, a feedback as not, not only to the comment and the question, but also some of the, what Tony said. Yes. Uh, See, I think. Uh, uh, okay. No, going right to a room. Fine. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, fine. You know, uh, g thanks, Tony, for the point uh, you mentioned, and I think Jan has pointed to the issue as well. Let's look at some of the statistics. 33% uh, of the po urban population in India lives in slums, okay? Uh, that's 33%. And if you look at the urban-rural divide, we have less than 40% 40, 40 of the population in South Asia 
that's India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and so on. It's less than 40% living in cities, in urban area. Uh, 60% is living in villages. So when we talk of smart cities, we talk of smart cities and smart villages. Okay. Uh, now, it points to the, uh, the, the need for scalability. So we need to be scaling whatever we are doing. That's one thing. The second thing is speed. Uh, you know, 70% of Africa is going to require new housing, new habitat in the coming generation. Uh, the task is enormous. Uh, and the other thing uh, we need to pick from the COVID lessons, uh, there is the digital divide, there is the social exclusion, there is a problem of migrants, there is a problem of the urban and rural divide. So we need to address those divides. And very often, it's not about the digital technology. Digital technology is going to improve the distribution, improve the efficiencies. But sometimes we are lacking in energy resources. We're lacking in uh, water resources. We are uh, lacking in simple house, uh, proper housing. Uh, so we need to tackle those issues. And, uh, uh, you know, the 1.7 billion that don't have access to that worldwide, uh, that's something to be taken seriously. And yes, then you can apply digital. But there's no point in taking digital uh, before you resolve some of those issues. So yes, digital, uh, but first the physical infrastructure and perhaps uh, the issue of leadership and governance also requires social infrastructure. We are, you know, we are talking about differences in the USA. We have great differences in the levels of human development index, health, education, whatever. So you need to bring the population up to participate in the democratic process. And and uh, and that's all over the world. Uh, not only India, I'm speaking from India, but that's true in Africa, that's true in other parts. Digital can also help that. Digital can help that. Digital Thank can you. help leapfrog. Thank you, Thank Arun. You. Thank you so much. And Ewan? Can you yes. uh, jump in based on what your organization is doing, bringing global leaders together and, and helping identify solutions? Yes. Yeah, I uh, fully agree with uh, our speakers and panelists uh, about humanity, society, because uh, uh, we think uh, technology is a platform, is a very good framework for us, but we need an uh, ecosystem of politics, society, economy, and uh, education. And that's the reason why uh, Boston Global Forum, we have created AI Society value system for increased uh, innovation. And uh, also we increase and support for people, they, any citizen, they can contribute innovation in politics, society. Because now in the world, uh, technology, innovation, that is easy to recognize an exchange value. But politics and society with new initiative, innovation, not so easy for the people to contribute for that. So we think we need to support for thinkers, politicians, uh, policy makers, and they contribute to improve and uh, reform politics and society by technology. That is the AI or society value system. We hope we have chance to contribute and introduce more about this system. So I fully agree with panelists from India. That great ideas for us to combine, and that's the reason why we do. Then we do contribute for Zenotic Nation Initiative with the Boston Global Forum. That is the Zenotic Nation Centennial Initiative. So I hope I will send our audience and all to our panelists more detail about AIWS City and AIWS system and uh, value system. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Nirwin. Thank you so much. And, and, and Joe, um, you know, from the perspective of, again, you're, you're kind of sitting up top, right? Uh, you know, Lockheed is doing so much in aerospace. And when we look at the future of cities, connectivity, we need aerospace, we need security, we need better infrastructure, right? And there's been more of a focus on space, believe it or not, because we need that core infrastructure. Um, you know, how, how do you see it, uh, you know, going back to, um, you know, our core questions, how do we rebuild that new normal, you know, urban economy with a clear understanding of the technology that we're using 
uh, to structure and manage our cities can also build a better tomorrow. And I think space really plays such an important role there. I think, you know, just, just a couple quick points, you know, building on some of the, the comments made by those <laughs> other speakers. You know, climate uh, is a really interesting topic. And I think coming out of the pandemic, you know, we've got to refocus on on climate change and the impacts, you know, sort of the immediate and the long-term impacts of climate on our cities. And uh, being able to first monitor and measure what's going on in the climate is really important. But also, you know, looking at the micro level Like if we're going to have, let's say, autonomous aircraft in a city, we need to know what the winds are in between the buildings, right? That's very different from knowing like the climate change over decades, right? So there's lots of different levels that they'll have to look at there. Um, And then the only the only other point I'll 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 add, really building on uh, Arun's comments uh, about um, so the equality uh, equality of of access and and, and the digital divide. I think one thing that we're keenly aware of is, you know, we want everyone to have access and have sort of equal access to everything, but that also could mean equally susceptible to hacking, cyber attacks, identity theft. I mean, we have to build those. The security uh, is something that really needs to be architected at a, at a top level. Um, And and putting together lots of different systems that are uh, in an ad hoc way, isn't going to work for, for secure uh, communications there. If we're talking about people's health data and, you know, someone's in an autonomous car, I mean, these these are mission critical systems that need to be really secure. Thank you so much, Joe. So now we're going to get into the speed round because we have just uh, about six minutes left and, uh, and a minute for each one of you. So if you could please keep it 60 seconds and I will definitely stop you at 60 seconds. I want all of you to provide sort of a closing on how do we rethink the form and function of the city? Just a, a short blurb, and we're going to start with Tony. Great, Sergio. I'll try to do this. is the 60-second version, um, and it's such a big topic, so it's kind of really hard to cover in 60 seconds. Oh, I know. Seconds. That, that's why I got you first. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, listen, I think we need to think of the rethink of the city in kind of this context of nodes, you know, and cultural context and all the things that were discussed before of the panelists are very important. But this this context of this work by Dr. Carlos Moreno on the 15 minute cities of self-sufficient nodes replete with emergency services, education, food, medicine, all within walking or biking distance with access, de-emphasizing automobile usages. You know, cities need to be adaptable and resilient. Um, depending on their location to pandemics and other threats, better communication between and among cities, regions, and territories through shared communication, decision-making platforms, environmental protection measures at a regional scale, blue-green networks, landscape belts, urban growth boundaries, and land use policies that encourage smart urban development. Not all development is bad. We need the, the built environment will double and triple in size in the next 30 years. If we don't disrupt the construction industry and integrate technology, then we're going to continue to disrupt the ecosystem and the environment. So it's really important that we kind of integrate and have a holistic approach to regenerative development if we're going to build back our cities better. So that actually dovetails right into you, Janice, because as the president of the League of Cities as well of of New Jersey municipalities, um, you know, there's that interconnected, not just your community, but how does everybody. uh, So please, what's your feedback? Thanks, Sergio. And, and it's everything Tony said. You know, I, I, I don't think I can reiterate it any differently. The only thing I would add is it, it's, it's not just cities, it's all communities, right? So we have to be careful that we don't focus solely on and just the urban because you've still got some of the suburban communities that are struggling and, and trying to manage through it as well. So it's, it's all of our communities and what do we look like and who are we going to be going forward and, and what does that resiliency look like and what do the new leaders look like? It's, it's important to make sure that we have this, the new normal is a, a new look at everything, not just one specific piece. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Nguyen, can um, you kind of, you know, give us your perspective on that, please? Yes, uh, I think uh, uh, new, uh, new urban and uh, new uh, city, now we think our box, uh, we connect from for example, from Zanet City, you can connect to another city by virtual. And AI to S City, we do that. We connect between uh, cities for exchange values. And we uh, create a system for the, any citizen in each city can exchange values. They create value. 
uh, Vinsub, Father of Internet, a member of our, of our, our AIWS City board. He has ideas to uh, increase any uh, citizen can create values for another, for other. And uh, so AIWS City make a uh, home, digital home for any citizen can do and can connect and can. So I think uh, we have new normal, new uh, connection, uh, new ideas for uh, virtual city, connect with real city and exchange value between cit uh, city, each, each cities and citizen from and mayor and government of cities to others. So that is my I, our ideas. So we are uh, contribute a AWS city uh, concept that is for AWS smart city. Yeah. Thank you very much, Owen. Thank you. Uh, Joe, when we're looking at that sort of form function, where does, uh, you know, you talked a lot about security, right? You talked a lot about the sort of the, 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 the element of, of protecting. Yeah, so just closing comment here on that. You know, I think this future, you know, re-envisioning of the city, uh, we need to have a dialogue about public safety and how this technology can really benefit uh, people, right? But at the same time, there's risks, right? So, you know, we can use technology for tracking and surveillance and monitoring and all those sound really bad, uh, but, but it actually can provide really great benefits, but there are privacy and, you know, and other issues. So it's really important to balance that and have a, have a dialogue about how we don't, uh, you know, go too far in, in one direction or the other on, on privacy and security. Thank you so much. And, and, and Arun, um, you know, from the five elements of your perspective, <laughs> would you wrap us uh, up? See, the one thing uh, I thought of when you were saying form and functionality is a lesson from strategy. Uh, and strategy tells you that structure follows strategy. So the structure, the form, and how you build it follows what you want to do. Uh, if you look at very old civilizations, uh, cities, urban areas were around trade, politics, religion. And my own, one of my hometowns in India is a city called Madurai. You have the temple right in the middle and you have a perfect grid of roads in square forms, almost perfectly around the temple. And you have various districts for different trades people, for, for different trades. Now, today, if you apply it today, again, it's structure follows strategy. But what's the strategy? Uh, it's about social equity. It's about human rights. It's about gender equality. It's about not leaving anybody behind. Uh, it's about the SDGs. It's about climate action. Uh, so those are the things that form the core. And then you try and see, as Janice said, how do you take it?